we're going to look at the next king in God's Game of Thrones. And this is going to be King Asa. This is one of my all-time favorite kings. So here's a brief description about Asa. Asa is Judah's third king. He reigns 41 years, so he's got a long reign. His name means healer. His spiritual state is is good which is surprising because a lot of these kings are wicked his tribe is judah his father is abijah that's the king that we just looked at last time his prov prophets are azariah and hanina hanani the seer he rules during the time of jeroboam nadab basha Zimri and Omri. Uh, his the texts that he's in is First Kings fifteen eight through twenty four, and Second Chronicles chapters fourteen fifteen and sixteen. And while we look at the story of King Asa, I want to focus on how to have victory in your Christian life. Let's look at the story of Asa and focus on the topic of how to have victory in your Christian life. The first thing about him that we see is that in his days it was quiet. In 2 Chronicles 14.1, it says, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. So you remember Abijah or Abijah. He was the king we studied last time that preached the red hot sermon. However, his talk was louder than his walk. But Abijah had a son named Asa. And Asa reigned in the stead of Abijah after he dies. Now notice in 2 Chronicles 14.1, it says, In his days the land was quiet ten years. I don't think this is because he wasn't listening to heavy metal and in a rock band with his friends anymore. I doubt that he was doing those things, but this means he wasn't experiencing any war for those 10 years. This reminds me of when I first got saved. For a little while, it was quiet. The Lord was letting me ease into it, I believe. I wasn't having big wars with the flesh. I wasn't really in any spiritual battles. I had no idea that victory in the Christian life was going to be a long, hard battle. Uh, Asa is shown to be a good king, and this is refreshing because Jeroboam made his own religion. Rehoboam forsook wise counsel. Abijah was wishy-washy. Asa is one of my favorite kings. In his days, the land was quiet about ten years. And when you first get saved, it might be a little bit quiet at first, but the battle is coming. So in his days, the land was quiet ten years, and also he wasn't using his members as instruments of unrighteousness. Asa was using his members as instruments of righteousness, as Paul talks about in Romans, that we need to do. But it says in Second Chronicles 14, 2, it says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. If we will ever have victory in our Christian life, then the Lord will be seeing us doing that which is good and right in the eyes of Him. As Paul says in Romans six twelve and 13, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Asa didn't take after his father. I don't see anywhere that he was being a ladies' man like his, his fathers were being. I don't see where he was worshiping idols. In 1 Kings 15 and verse 9, it says, And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. Once again, Jeroboam pops up. He reigned a long time as well. He has popped up in every study that we've done so far. The fact that Asa was reigning while Jeroboam was reigning made Asa look even better. 
A man that has a little bit of morals will look like a saint compared to Jeroboam or to the men that we have in the White House today. Jeroboam had it ever recovered strength after his fight with Abijah and Judah. So Asa saw firsthand that living wicked and not relying on the Lord would not get you anywhere. 1 Kings 15.10 says, In forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now Abishalom is David's son Absalom. That's Absalom. So Maacah is Absalom's daughter. And something to note is that Maacah is Asa's grandmother. She was Abijah's mother. Abijah is Asa's father. Maacah was Abijah's mother. This shows that the Bible will sometimes refer to a person as someone's father or mother, but it's actually their grandparent. And this will clear up some confusion for you. So it calls uh, Maacah Asa's mother when it's his grandmother. So the, the Bible, that's how the Bible uses it. There's no contradiction. There's no error there. That's just how the Bible says it. But Asa reigned 41 years, and that's a long reign, more than his grandfathers, David and Solomon. Uh, Asa had a great bloodline. He had a mighty man like David in his genes, and David was also a Bible man. He had that in his genes. He also had a wise man like Solomon in his genes. 1 Kings 15, 11, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. All the kings are compared to David. David is a type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You are a king today. You are compared to Jesus Christ. And when it comes to your salvation, you are seen just as good as he is. This is because he gave you his righteousness when you got saved. However, when it comes to your everyday walk, you should try to be as holy as Jesus Christ. That is striving per for perfection, literally. That is yielding your members as instruments of righteousness. So just like Asa, it said that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Every day you need to be trying to conform yourself to Jesus Christ and try to do right like Jesus Christ did. Asa did that for the most part. He was like David for the most part. He wasn't in the body of Christ. He wasn't sealed into the day of redemption. He wasn't spiritually circumcised. Circumcised. He didn't have his sins taken away. However, under the Old Testament law, he was doing the best he could at that time. Second uh, Chronicles 14.3, it says, For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves. The people were up in the high places in groves where they would worship the strange gods, the gods that they had picked up from other nations. They would worship the graven images. Asa came through and cleaned house. He even cut down the groves. That is the trees where they were doing all this stuff in. Men like to do stuff in the shadows. As it says in Hosea 4.13, they sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills and under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. You can apply all this stuff for you practically today. You may not be a physical king like Asa, but you are a king in Christ Jesus and you are in control of how you live in your, in your life. God doesn't make you do anything. It is your responsibility to choose to do right. It is your responsibility to put Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart. It's your responsibility to break down your images, just like Asa. If Instagram is causing you to sin, then delete your Instagram. Get rid of the filthy images. Get rid of the high places. Here it says Asa removed them, but they seem to pop back up sometime during or at the end of his reign in first kings fifteen fourteen, it says but the high places were not removed nevertheless asa's heart was perfect with the lord all his days so either he uh, got rid of them and they popped back up or he just couldn't get rid of all of them at the same time but even though asa got rid of them at one point if he didn't finish with them removed then they are counted as still being there try it Try your best to finish with the high places of your life removed. Quit going to the high places. That can represent your besetting sin, your pet sin that you're struggling with. Cut down the grove so that you don't feel comfortable doing that sin anymore. 
Asa cut down those groves. There was no, no shadow to do it anymore. Don't give yourself something to hide behind. Don't get alone and in a position where you can pet your besetting sin. Another great trait about Asa is that he didn't just quit thinking about God during times of prosperity. He instructed the people to work during prosperity. So Asa, in his days, the land was quiet, 10 years. He used his members as instruments of, of righteousness. And the third thing is he instructed the people to work during prosperity. Things may be going good right now for you, but they aren't always going to be going good. It says in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 14, 4 through 6, And commanded Judah, Asa commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. He also took out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images and the kingdom was quiet before him and he built fenced cities in Judah. For the land had rest and he had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. If you're living comfortably right now, then you still need to build. The moment you get saved, you start building. You are either building with wood and hay or you're building with gold, precious stones, and pearls. You either, you're either building in the sand or on a rock. You need to help someone in the ministry or start your own or do something for the Lord. Asa instructed the people to seek God. Asa was living comfortably in prosperity. It will be like that in your Christian life sometimes. However, if you want victory, you need to be building for when the enemy comes over the hill. It may be going good right now, but you need to be building something. Right now, I'm trying to build my knowledge of the scriptures. Right now, I'm trying to get all of my Bible together. I want references and comments next to each verse of my Bible. I want a description at the beginning of each chapter. I want an outline of the book at the beginning of each book of the Bible. I want to memorize so many verses a week and read so many chapters a day. Then when trouble comes, I've got a word for it. If you have the word in you, then you can give it to others. If somebody asks me a Bible question, I want to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh, asketh me a reason of the hope that is in me. Asa did something great for the people. He instructed the people to work during times of prosperity. Another thing is he instilled the word in the people of Judah. Look back at Second Chronicles 14.4. It says, and commanded you to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. One of the greatest things you can do is instill the word in somebody else. Lead someone else to the Bible. Getting someone else interested in the scriptures. When I teach on here or in Sunday school, my main burden is to get Christians interested in the Bible. I want them to be in love with the words of God. In Psalm 119, 161, it says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I, I, that's how I am every day. I'm in awe of the word. And I don't see how any Christian couldn't be in awe of the word if they got into it. In Job 23, 12, it says, I have steamed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I'd say that I probably go through many chapters a day and study for for many hours before I actually even eat anything. I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. If you put the word in you, then that's what is going to come out of you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The land was quiet for Asa for a while. Then an enemy appears. Enemies are going to appear. It is going to happen. For you today, Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Romans 8, 8, 31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Asa was about to see. So Asa, he instructed the people to work in prosperity. He instilled in people the word of God. And now Asa is about to see innumerable enemies defeated. The land was quiet for him 10 years, but now the enemy comes over the hill. If you rely on the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of men. And Asa is about to go from living with no real obstacle or anything to seeing innumerable enemies in his face. And this is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. I don't know that I've ever even heard anybody talk about this 
uh, in a in a study or a sermon. Maybe I just haven't got a hold of the right one. But you just won't hear many ser- sermons about this story. It's tucked in here in in Second Chronicles fourteen eight. It says, And Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears, out of Judah three hundred thousand, and out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bows, two hundred and fourscore thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. Now that is a, that's a lot of mighty men. They would be much more mighty than any of these fighters that you see today. These guys here under Asa were raised up warriors. These were real mighty men. In verse 9 it says, And there came out against them Zera the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came unto Maresha. So a thousand thousand is one million. And this is an innumerable amount of enemies coming right at Asa and Judah. That's too many to even count. In Second Chronicles 14.10, Asa went out against him and they set the battle in array in the valley of Z- Zephatha at Marisha. When you're going up against an innumerable amount of enemies, if you want the victorious Christian life, then you're going to have to be like Asa and be, this is the next point, instant in prayer. When you see innumerable enemies coming at you, you're going to have to get down and be instant in prayer. In Second Chronicles 14.11, it says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God, and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest in, on thee. And in thy name we go against the mul- this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. You can tell Asa is an experienced prayer warrior. He said to the Lord, It is nothing with thee to help. Genesis 18, 14 says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Isaiah 40, 17 says, All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Have you ever heard the saying, That wasn't nothing for him? Well, it isn't nothing for the Lord to get in any situation you have and fix it. If you want victory... It will come through prayer. Paul said, pray without ceasing. He was always mentioning someone in prayer. He said, let your requests be made known unto God. Second Chronicles fourteen twelve. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. There goes those innumerable enemies. Second Chronicles fourteen thirteen. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. The Ethiopians were overthrown. And when it comes to your spiritual battles, you need to let the Lord lead and go through them like a bulldozer. He will overthrow them like he did those tables when you read in the Gospels. Let him do this until the enemies can't recover themselves. The Ethiopians couldn't recover. You need to take the hammer of the word and nail the coffin so shut on your pet sin that there isn't left a crack for it to seep out. So the Ethiopians were destroyed before the Lord. It was the Lord that swept through. And Asa and Judah carried away much spoil. In Second Chronicles 14, 14 and 15 it says, And they smote all the cities round about Gerar. For the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they spoiled all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smote also the tents of cattle, and carried away sheep and camels in abundance, and returned to Jerusalem. So they carried away some spoil, meaning they took away a bunch of their stuff. And I'm sure they left their rap CDs. I'm sure they left the Ethiopians' country music behind. I'm sure they didn't take their Ten Seasons of Friends DVDs, because All that stuff like that is why the Ethiopians were ungodly in the first place. Maybe they took some of their AirPods out of their ears and said, hey, maybe I can use this to listen to some preaching. The Ethiopians were using it to listen to Morgan Wallen. But Asa would use it to listen to some old Maze Jackson or Billy Kelly or Danny Castle or James Lentz. They might have took their their iPads. The Ethiopians had porn on theirs, but Judah could wipe it clean, restore it, get the sermon audio app, write their outlines on it. A lot of 
preachers use the iPads to write their outlines on it. I don't see nothing wrong with that. In your Christian life, when you get victory in battle, you carry away some things with you. You carry away some war stories. You carry away experience. You carry away some patience because tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And as a king, he was also trying to not only instill the word in Judah, instruct them to work in prosperity. Uh, he was instant in prayer, and he also irons the wrinkles out of the land. After that great battle with the Ethiopians, the Lord sent a preacher. And this man's name was Azariah, the prophet Azariah. He is the one who preached the word of God straight and led Asa to iron the wrinkles out even more than he already had. In Second Chronicles 15, 1 through 2, and the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you, while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you, but if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. That is a rough message. Notice that this isn't something Azariah would preach if he were here at a camp meeting today. Because today the Lord isn't going to forsake you, no matter what you do. Azariah said, the Lord is with you while you be with him. You see the dispensational differences. Today, if you're saved, the Lord is always with you. In Colossians 1.27, Paul says, For us today, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In 2 Chronicles 15.3, it says, Now for a long season Israel hath, hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. During that time, they had been enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, a long season. They hadn't had a teacher. Many times Christians don't act like Christians, and they go without a teacher. They go without a preacher. They never grow. They never get the victorious Christian life. Because 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're not growing in your knowledge of Jesus, then you're not going to grow as a Christian. Israel had been without a teaching priest and without law. Many Christians today are without a Bible. It's on their shelf. It's in their car with the bonded leather peeling off. It is left in the church pew. They don't know which Bible is right. And they may have the right Bible, but they couldn't tell you why it's the right one. They're in a mess. Second Chronicles 15, 3 and 4 says, Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. In James 4, 8 it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. If you make a move towards God... He's just waiting with open arms. He wants fellowship more than you do. Second Chronicles 15, 5 through 7. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them all with adversity. And he says, Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak. For your work shall be rewarded. Paul, Paul says in the New Testament, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Don't let your hands be weak. In 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians 4.11, Paul says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So be strong in the Lord and work with your hands. Your labor is not in vain. The work that you do will be rewarded. If you're a Christian... And if you do the reward work with the right motive, it's going to be rewarded. Now, 2 Chronicles 15, 8, it says, And when Asa heard these words, these words of the preacher, when he heard the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage, and he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. So he took courage because somebody preached what God wanted them to preach. That should be what good preaching does. If you, It should give you courage. And Asa's response to hard preaching was perfect here. He gets rid of the idols out of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities he had taken over. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, it says, For they, sh for they themselves show of us what manner of en entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Then Asa renewed the altar. 
An altar then isn't like the altar you use today. Practically speaking, though, you can look at this and say you should renew your prayer life because today we we go to the front of the church and we pray at an altar. I don't see anything wrong with that. There's people that's against it. There's people that's all for it. I think you're at liberty to pray where you want to pray. I don't make a big deal about stuff like that. And practically speaking, when you see this about Asa renewing the altar, you can look at this as you should renew your prayer life. Be instant in prayer, just like he was. We talked about earlier. Then in 2 Chronicles 15, 9 through 12, it says, And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin, and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh, and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance, when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had bought, brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind. If you're going to have victory in your Christian life, then you're going to have to get to the place where God is the most important thing in your life. Enter into a covenant to seek the Lord God of your fathers with all their heart and with all their soul is what Asa and Judah did. In Second Chronicles fifteen thirteen, it says that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Now, dispensationally considered, we don't do this today. This is proof every church in your town is dispensational, whether they know it or not, or almost all the church members would be dead because most Christians don't seek the Lord. It said in 2 Chronicles fifteen thirteen that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. There's not a church in your town that does this, and they shouldn't do this. This is a completely different time period. This is under a time period when it's about the kingdom of heaven and not about the spiritual kingdom of God. This is in a time period when, when they were under the law, and we're not. So, we couldn't practice this, practice this literally in our life today. However, you could say you need to get the people out of your life that are holding you back from seeking the Lord or doing the right thing. People will hinder you. It says in verse 14 of Second Chronicles 15, And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. Many people are against people getting excited or people shouting and things like that. There are people that are genuinely doing that from the heart. It is an all for show. And it's not just all in the flesh. If if someone does that, just say, well, that that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that they're charismatic if they're shouting and running around. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean they're in the flesh or they're showing off. Now, some people are showing off but you shouldn't just assume that they are. In Second Chronicles fifteen fifteen, it says, And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with all their whole desire. And he was found to them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. A lot of people think that they have done something too wicked or have lived for the devil so long that God wouldn't want anything to do with them. But look at this verse. They sought him with their whole heart, and he was found of them. All they had to do was call on him. God is desiring for people to seek him. He's not going to play hard to get. A lot of people act like God is up there just playing hard to get, like their girlfriend or something. He's not playing any games with people. Uh, go to First Kings, and you'll find something else that King Asa did when he got right with the Lord. In First Kings fifteen twelve, it says, And he took away the Sodomites out of the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. The Sodomites are what the world calls homosexuals. Isn't it something that God put that in the Bible? A king got his heart really right with God and kicked all the Sodomites out of the land. Yet people in leadership today are all about the Sodomite. They don't just stand up for the rights of the LGBT. They want to give them more rights than you have. What an ungodly trash pile we are in. The further you go with sexual sin, the more wicked it will become. 
When your grandfather was in school, they watched videos against the sodomites, warning them about it. Today, most people are against pedophilia. When you're an old man or an old woman, they will probably be saying a pedophile pervert can't help that he loves little boys and that and it's just love and you can't help who you love because sin gets worse and worse people get worse and worse it's not cute it's not sweet there's nothing sweet about a man like another man it's sick in second chronicles fifteen sixteen, it says and also concerning Maacah, the mother of ace of the king he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burned it at the brook Kedron. So Asa had to remove his mother from being queen because of her idolatry. That is how right with God he got. She made an idol in a grove. She had it up all pretty and decorated. She probably posted it on Pinterest and TikTok and all the other women loved it and gave it likes and thumbs up and smiley faces. And then Asa just comes and pulls it up and cuts it down and stomps on it and then burns it and there's just something about burning the thing that's causing you to sin in acts 19 19 it says many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver asa had to go against his own family that is how right with god he had become in Matthew 10, 37, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Asa had to go against his own family. He got so right with God. In 2 Chronicles 15, 17, it says, But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Asa did not completely get rid of all the high places. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect. This proves that perfect does not mean sinless. The Lord saw the heart of Asa that he was trying to iron the wrinkles out. He was trying to clean house. And at the end of the day, the Lord knows you are made of sinful flesh. God isn't stupid. He knows the holiness to preacher who says you've got to be perfect. He knows he's got bad doctrine. And this verse can be a comfort in Second Chronicles fifteen 17. I'll never be sinless. But I can still please God and my heart can be considered right even though sometimes I mess up. Now you shouldn't approach, approach this verse by saying you can keep a pet sin or two in your life because Asa kept some of the high places and nevertheless his heart was perfect for the Lord God all his days even though he, he kept something. However, another good way to approach it is let it change the way you look at other Christians. Every Christian you know is going to have that smudge in their life ace has got everything right but he teaches this certain doctrine you don't like a preacher has everything right but he's divorced and remarried uh this preacher you like he does everything right except he did this certain thing in his past or a any christian something along those lines every, and every preacher has something about him that the devil will use to try and keep you from listening to him in 2 Chronicles 15, 18, and 19, it says, And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated, and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war until the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. So he was ironing the wrinkles out. He was trying to clean house. He was trying to make things straight. He was trying to be on the good and narrow way. He was trying to get in line the things that his fathers had turned backwards and he came out in objection to some things that his father allowed. So that brings us to our next point. King Asa heard the preaching of the prophet, and he improved on the past. We have already seen how he took the Sodomites out of the land, and that's something his grandfather didn't even do. Under the reign of Rehoboam, the Sodomites were in the land committing abominations. In 1 Kings fourteen twenty four. it says, And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations with the Lord, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. <clears throat> it seems there remained a little remnant of the Sodomites in the land during the reign of Asa, according to 1 Kings twenty two forty six. but at least he attempted at one time to get them out. And we have seen how he wasn't swayed by his grandmother, Mecca. He removed her from being queen because of her idolatry. 
as I said, he had to go against his own family. Just because your dad was a drunk doesn't mean you have to be a drunk. Just because he's a lazy slob that won't work don't mean you have to be that. If your mother is a whore, that doesn't mean you have to walk in her footsteps. You can break the cycle and improve on the past. Learn from history. You can see the negative effects those things are having on your family. And you can choose the right way. My dad was a drunk that was talking to me about drinking with him when I was 12. As a 12-year-old lost kid, I saw the effects that sin had on him. And I knew it was a bad decision. He died in his 40s. The way of the transgressor is hard. His father did the same thing to him and his brother. They were drinking at an early age. You have to be the one to break the cycle. You may not love yourself enough not to do those things, but what about your children? Do you want your son growing up to be a drunk? Do you want your uh, son growing up being a deadbeat sissy? The drugs and alcohol make you weak. I work with so many people in, in factories, and it's like a revolving door. They come in and they come out. I've trained so many people, and these big, tough, rough-looking guys that drink and do drugs are the biggest babies. They act like that stuff makes you tough, but it makes you weak. You can improve on the past. Don't follow in your father's footsteps if he's like Rehoboam and Abijah. Now, if he's like David, then follow in his footsteps. David had some faults. He was human. But David was a, a good man to follow in his footsteps. If you really want to be right, read the word. Try to be as much like Jesus as you can. You can improve on the past. You don't have to be like your parents and make all the same mistakes they made. Now we're going to see the inconsistency of Asa. Up to this point, we've, we've not seen anything that Asa has really done wrong. Asa's heart was perfect. However, he is still flesh. We still have inconsistencies. This means we all have room for improvement. And we don't have room to get puffed up. If you're going to have victory in your Christian life, then you should acknowledge your inconsistencies and realize where you need to improve. In Second Chronicles 16.1, In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So we are in the thirty-sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, and he's in conflict with Basha, king of Israel. Now, Basha is building Ramah with the intentions of keeping trade and things from coming into Judah. He had the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa. And then 1 Kings fifteen sixteen says, And there was a war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And this is a picture of the Christian in battle with the flesh all the days of his life. In Galatians 5, 17, it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So it says this about Asa. And this is where he messes up in 2 Chronicles 16, 2 and 3. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house, and sent to Benadad, the king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So Asa is giving the treasure of the house of the Lord. Remember when Asa's grandfather Rehoboam got into it with the king of Egypt, and the king of Egypt took the treasures from the house of the Lord. In 1 Kings 14, 25 through 26, it says, And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, Egypt came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away the shields of gold that, which Solomon had made. Asa, giving the treasures of the house of the Lord to Benadad, king of Syria, pictures the Christians selling out to the world and counting the world more important than the Lord's treasures. 
In Matthew 6, 19 and 20, it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Asa was giving away the treasures of the house of the Lord to Benadad in exchange for this earthly security. He was wanting security here on earth. He was wanting to make a league with this person. In 2 Chronicles 16, 4 and 5, it says, And Benadad hearkened unto King Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote Elgin and Dan and Ab abel Mayim and all the store cities of Nephtali. And it came to pass when Basha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. So this foreign aid that Asa is getting, it, he's getting this foreign aid and it works for a while. It isn't the way God wants things done. He should have just called on the Lord like before. In 2 Chronicles 16, 6, Then Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. So Asa took all the supplies of Basha that he was using against him, and he used it for himself, and I mean, you can turn this into a good principle. Take the enemy's sword and whack him with it, like David did. Use the devil's internet to get the word of God out. So Basia took the supplies Basia was using against him and used it for himself. And earlier we saw how Asa had a great response to preaching. He listened to it and applied the words of it to his life. But now towards the end of his reign, this doesn't happen. So one of his inconsistencies was that he was insulted by the preaching. In Second Chronicles 16, 7, it says, And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. You see how Asa, he took the treasures of the house of the Lord and gave them to Benadad king of Syria. He was trying to get foreign aid. He was trying to get security without seeking God. So Hanani says, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. And not relied on the Lord thy God. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. So Hanani the seer preached against the inconsistency of Asa. He exposes the fact that instead of relying on the Lord, he relied on the king of Syria to help him in the matter with King Baasha. Second Chronicles 16.8 says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord... He delivered them into thine hand. When Asa and Judah cried to the Lord about that one million man army, the Lord delivered them. Why wouldn't they cry to him to deliver them in the situation when Basha was building Ramah? Always trust in the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? In Second Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have rewards. Remember, it said before that Asa's heart was perfect. That this preaching of Hananiah, Hananiah had to be blistering because it got personal when he said, the Lord shows himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. So it seems like Asa's heart wasn't perfect toward the Lord at this point anymore. Hananiah is quick to tell him that he is acting a fool and that he's going to be at war the rest of his life. The more deep in sin you get as a Christian, today we can look at this, the more deep in sin you get as a Christian, the bigger fight with the flesh you're going to have. The more you feed the flesh, the stronger it becomes, and the stronger it becomes, the harder it is to turn it down. Now you're going to see Asa's horrible reaction to the preacher. In 2 Chronicles 16.10, it says, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. So some people would love to put the preacher in prison every Sunday. And that's what they're doing in Canada right now. And it's coming to a church near you. But in 2 Chronicles 16.11, it says, And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, Lo, are they written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So we've been looking at the books of 1 Kings as well.
along with Chronicles, First and Second uh, Chronicles, or First and Second King emphasizes the kings of Israel. First and Second Chronicles emphasizes the kings of Judah. Now we're going to see something that pictures our Christian walk with the Lord when we aren't living right. In 2 Chronicles 16, 12, it says, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet, it, yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Asa was diseased in his feet. His walk was messed up. And if you as a Christian quit listening to the preacher, you quit reading your Bible, you stop serving the Lord, then you, you will see yourself get diseased in your feet. Romans 10, 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of pre peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Are you diseased in your feet or do you have beautiful feet right now in your Christian walk? Asa's feet was looking ugly towards the end of his reign. They probably started calling him names. He probably wouldn't even go swimming anymore at the pool parties because he was so embarrassed about his ugly feet. I mean, if he went to an Asian massage parlor and one of the employees threw up when they took his shoes off. He couldn't warm his feet on his wife's leg anymore because she'd just say, ooh, get them things off of me. She probably said, your feet stinketh, Asa. I mean, his, he was all messed up in his feet. Uh, a messed up walk will get in your marriage and in, in your everyday life with people. You will be a miserable Christian with a bad testimony. If you let your walk get messed up and you get diseased in your feet. Asa, towards the end of his reign, he was diseased in his feet. He started out so good. But in Second Chronicles sixteen thirteen it says, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. It doesn't seem like he, he finished his course with joy. Maybe he did. Maybe there's something that's not written here. I hope he did because he's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. But in 2 Chronicles 16, 12, it says, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. He sought the physicians instead of the Lord. He didn't like what Hanani the prophet said, what the seer said, so he went to the doctor. In 2 Chronicles 16, 14, it says, And they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices prepared by the apothecary's art, and they made a very great burning for him. So it seems he didn't finish as good as he started spiritually, but he made sure his coffin had sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices. But I'd rather finish my course good and better than I started it and be buried in a cardboard box than not to finish my course as well as I started and be buried in an air-conditioned coffin. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it looks like he didn't finish as well as he probably wanted to, but yet he made sure that his coffin, where his dead body would go, had sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices. Uh... Nevertheless, as a whole, I believe his heart was mostly right with the Lord, especially compared to other kings. He's always been one of my favorite kings. Uh, I, th I would consider his spiritual state to be good for the most part. But he's got those smudges in there, just like we all got smudges. I mean, his smudges compared to ours are probably not that bad. And we've all got inconsistencies. We've all got things we need to improve upon. And we can look at others and, you know, we see that they're inconsistencies. And we need to remember when we look at them that we got inconsistencies. All the characters in the Bible have inconsistencies. And we should not be so hard on other people, on other Christians that are obviously trying to do right. They're trying their best to serve God. And we should take it easy on them and not have such high expectations for them when we can look at ourselves and see that we don't even have high expectations for ourselves most times. But this has been the great story of King Asa and how we need to have victory in our Christian life.